You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast exploring the scripture and all things related to it. New episodes are released daily. For more information, check out glossahouse.com and subscribe to our channels on Spotify and YouTube. Welcome and enjoy. Shalom and welcome to this week's SLA Insight. Uh, my name is Dr. Jennifer Noonan, and we're continuing this discussion on comprehensible input, its importance for language acquisition, and how we um, promote the use of good comprehensible input in our classrooms. We're looking currently at increasing the quality or the type of comprehensible input, specifically through the use of a, an approach called processing instruction, an intervention that is sometimes used in the context of, of a communicative language approach, but certainly can be used in uh, ancient language teaching as well. We're trying to overcome the limited attentional resources, the limited working memory that a learner brings. And so we're looking at ways to manipulate that input to help the learner to promote more effective and efficient processing of language data. So in previous episodes, I've talked about input enhancement, input flood. And so again, we're continuing today with processing instruction, and we're looking at kind of getting an insight into the learner's brain and how they typically um, process input, what's going on in their brain when they're looking at new language input to look for inefficiencies and look for um, misuse or misallocation of working memory in such a way that we can create input for them that will help them work around or learn to, um, to not use their inefficient default strategies. So last week and this week, we're talking a little more theoretically, again, getting inside a learner's brain to understand how it works, so that in future episodes, we can discuss how to create what are called structured input activities that work with or against, as needed, these default processing strategies. So we're kind of breaking down how a learner approaches new input, how they process it, what they're looking for, what they take in, what they don't take in, and and using that then. So in future episodes, again, we'll be looking at more practical ways to take this information I'm presenting today and use it to create activities that will help a student um, more efficiently take in input or intake from the input they receive. The input is on the outside of them. Intake is what they actually get out of the input, and they're not going to drive all the input from the intake they receive. Again, limited working memory, limited attentional resources, so we need to maximize their ability to derive intake from that input. So last week, I talked about the first noun principle, or sorry, excuse me, the primacy of meaning principle. Today, we're going to talk about the first noun principle. The primacy of meaning uh, principle last week um, talks about how learners are going to look for meaning before they look for form. They're going to process input for meaning before they process it for form. This week, we're going to look at the uh, first noun principle. And the first noun principle is that learners tend to process the first noun or pronoun they encounter in a sentence as the subject or the agent. Now, in English, that makes perfect sense because English has fixed word order. The first noun we encounter is very, very regularly the subject. But if you have languages like Greek and Latin with case endings, you can mix up that word order in all kinds of ways that English cannot. And the first noun you run into may or may not be the subject. So for example, we say in English, the dog bit the man, all right? The dog in Greek or Latin would be in the nominative case, the man in the accusative case, which means you can flip it around and say the man in the accusative case bit the dog in the nominative case, and it means basically the same thing. So the case endings are going to tell you which is the subject, but a learner approaching that sentence who is still not internalizing case endings is going to read it and think, oh, it means the man bit the dog, even though the case endings are telling you something different. And it's because they attribute 
the first noun as being the subject, the first noun you run into. Now in Hebrew, the situation is somewhat similar without case endings, but they do have the particle et, which will mark the definite direct object, which means, again, Hebrew has word order that can be more flexible. You can pretty easily put the object first um, before the subject. And so, again, a similar situation can come up where the student will read, run into the object, think it's the subject, and misinterpret the sentence. So this is especially true, of course, for people whose L1, their first language is English, but it holds true across the board for other languages as well. Um, so again, this principle is the first noun principle, where learners are going to process the first noun or pronoun as a, in the sentence as the subject or the agent. Now, there are a few exceptions, sort of corollaries, um, to this rule. The first is the lexical semantics principle. That is, the learners may rely on lexical semantics where possible instead of word order to interpret the sentence. And this gets back to the primacy of meaning. They're using vocabulary to decide if this works or not rather than form, okay? Um, so for an example, we can say the apple in the accusative case, ate the horse in the nominative case, Lexical semantics, however, will tell us that apples do not eat, and if they did, they probably would not be eating a horse. So, on the other hand, horses do eat apples. Therefore, the lexical semantics of the, the sentence will help prevent the learner from identifying the first noun as the subject in that particular sentence. So that's one exception. Similar exception is the event probabilities principle. So learners may re rely on event probabilities where possible instead of word order to interpret the sentence. And in the first example I gave where it's the dog bit the man or the man bit the dog, um, if the man in the accusative bit the dog in the nominative, they can think through and go, well, that's possible, but not likely. And so event probabilities tells them it's probably the other way around, that the dog is doing the biting. Um, so that would force them to look a little more closely and perhaps uh, notice the case endings and be able to interpret the sentence correctly. So again, similar to the, the first exception, lexical semantics or event probabilities could force the learner to not use the first noun principle. The third and final exception is what's called the contextual constraint principle. And for this, you need to consider the wider context of the, the statement being said. And that wider context may inform the learner as to what is going on and constrain possible interpretations of a sentence uh, that may be uh, ambiguous otherwise if they're not paying attention to case endings. So, for example, in the context of a very fanciful story about a wolf eating chicken, it might be possible to have a chicken eating a wolf. And the, the event probabilities in the real world would tell you, no, that's not likely or even possible in most cases. But in the context of this fanciful fairy tale, perhaps it could happen. And it, again, the event probability would get them past, um, the, sorry, the wider context would get them past their default first noun principle. So in summary, the principle that I'm covering today is the first noun principle that says that the first noun a student encounters in the sentence is more likely to be processed as the subject or agent, even though it may not actually be the case. And so looking forward in the next couple episodes, we're going to be looking at ways to structure the input to help them move away from that default, to teach them to process the sentence differently so that they don't automatically assign the first noun as the, the subject or the agent when that may or may not be the case. So in conclusion, there are two basic principles of input processing, two ways that learners typically process 
language with a few corollaries and exceptions. The first being the primacy of meaning principle. In other words, learners are going to process the input for meaning, for vocabulary before they process it for form, for grammatical endings, for case endings, that sort of thing. That's the first principle of input processing, which I covered in the previous episode. This episode is the first noun principle, which is, says that learners will process the first noun in a sentence as the subject or the agent. Now, these default processing strategies may lead to them being inefficient in deriving intake from their input that they receive. They may misuse or misallocate their working memory, the, the attentional resources they have available, and they may divert their attention to the wrong place in the wrong direction. So ultimately, their language processing is going to be more inefficient if they rely on these default processing strategies. So in upcoming episodes, I'm going to talk about ways to create input, to manipulate input in such a way to move them away from these default strategies. So this week and last week have been more theoretical, but my plan is to make it more practical, to use this information as foundational, to look at some practical ways to structure your input to help learners be more efficient in processing that input. So I hope you will join me as we look for more practical ways to create input that is useful for learners. I hope you can join me. So in the meantime, have a great week. Interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start? Glow's House can help. From illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars, Glow's House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glosahouse.com today. Glosa House, language resources for the global community.